Good afternoon, I'm Sam from Cotswold Seeds and we're here at Farm Ed, which is our educational facilities in the Cotswolds. It's between Oxford and Cheltenham, just outside Chipping Norton. We're early November now, just about, and we're looking at some of the SARIC mixes, the diverse lays for the uh, diverse forage project. This particular field we're in here is one of our more diverse mixes, 18, 20 different species. And we know from the SARIC project, we had everything from the very simple ryegrass monocultures into eight and 12 way mixes and the more diverse stuff like this. So this is one of our more diverse mixes. We're very lucky to be part of the SARIC project. We're one of the farmer uh, trials, so field trials, and we've had these mixes in for about four or five years now. Up here, we're on very thin soils. We're Cotswold brash and we're limestone. We've got about four inches of soil, um, which is why we're particularly interested in growing these deep rooted herbal lays. In this particular mixture, we've got a mix here of grasses, legumes and herbs or forbs as they might be called. And predominantly they've been grazed, uh, possibly cut as well as part of their management. Now they're coming to the end of their life. We're late in the season as well, so they're starting to look a little bit raggedy. They'll probably get grazed once more this autumn and then be put to bed for the winter. So these diverse mixes include lots of different species. Now we all know um, about rye grasses, we know about some of the more traditional clovers, red clover, white clover, but for a minute or two I just want to hone in on some of the other species we use in these more diverse mixes. So where does it come from? Well here's a seed mix. And in there you can see we've got small uh, clover seeds, we've got larger seeds like samphoin with a big husk and lots of grass seeds as well. Here they are. So this is one of the lesser utilised grasses in our seed mix. Why do we use this diversity? Well, interestingly, on our thin soils here, this is coxfoot. It's a particularly deep rooted species, much deeper rooting than ryegrass. On this dry limestone brashy soil, we know in the, in the summer, it dries out completely. Interesting as well with coxfoot, it's an early one to grow in the spring. Up here in May this year, we were having frost. Coxfoot was the only grass I saw putting on any growth when we had really cold temperatures and cold winds. So it's early, it gives us some seasonal growth and also some great drought resistance. Interestingly, it's had a bit of a bad rep over the years of being coarse and clumpy, but a lot of that comes down to management and there are some better, newer, softer leaves varieties coming onto the market as well. So there could be a bit more of a future for it. But I think in terms of diversity, it's a really useful plant. Okay, so just carry on this uh, theme of diversity. We've got one of the more easier to establish uh, forage herbs here. So this is plantain or ribgrass, used a lot in New Zealand. A lot of the breeding's gone over there as well. And um, it's a really nice species, very palatable. Interestingly, we know that it's full of minerals and nutrients as well. As I've said up here already, we're on dry ground. So this deep rooting species, as you can see, really helped to keep it green when we're into July and August to give us some decent forage. Easy to manage as well. It doesn't have this bolting effect that we see with chicory. Um, so it's one of the easier to establish, more reliable forage herbs. The plantain's a really useful one. Okay, so one of the other more reliable forage herbs, easy to establish, chicory. It's one of the deepest rooters by a mile. And again, on this dry ground, it's really useful. I, the, I, I dug this up this morning and you can see already that I broke off some of the rooting. This would be going down much further in the soil profile. Again, chicory is packed full of minerals and nutrients. We know it's got twice the amount of selenium as an example uh, to a ryegrass plant, as well as lots of other uh, vitamins and minerals. So it can be really useful to enhance the availability of these minerals to livestock, as well as deep rooting, drought resistant, and interestingly enough, it has a real effect on the worm burden of animals as well. So it tends to reduce the amounts of worms in livestock, uh, sheep, and also cattle as well. Okay, so just moving on to the legumes uh, in the mixture. This is samphoin, a particularly useful legume to us. It's very deep rooted again, drought resistant. You might see a theme here, particularly nutritious to stock as well high in protein, and interestingly, it contains tannins, the same sort of thing that we see in tea and wine, which will help improve the gut health of the animal and also reduce the worm burden by reducing the worm cycle in, in livestock. 
One thing with Sanfoin, it loves dry ground, high pH, thin, chalky or limestone soil. So on the top of the Cotswolds here, we're perfect. If you're on the heavy clays um, or more acidic soil, you're gonna struggle to grow it, unfortunately. But it is a really interesting crop, really useful species on the right ground. So just staying with our theme of livestock health and the health of the animal, Unfortunately, not everyone can grow sandfoin, although it's got some really good benefits. It's called healthy hay, that's what its French name is. But there are other species available. So this is bird's foot trefoil, a much smaller plant, a much finer plant, but also it contains those same tannins that we see in sandfoin. So in terms of anti-worming, anti-bloat as well, it can be a really useful component of these diverse mixes. Up here in 2018, when it was really, really dry all the way through spring and summer, this was the only plant I saw green in August, um, apart from the chicories, of course, and you can see why. This has only been planted uh, this year, and look at the rooting already. It's almost as, as tall as the plant is itself. Okay, I want to finish on the, the final sort of individual species we're looking at. This is sheep's parsley. Now, the reason I put this one on the board is, as always, it's a, it's a herb, it's full of minerals and nutrients, iron especially. It's a pretty good rooter as well, but it's a short-term herb. So we do tend to find in these more diverse mixes, the balance of the mix will change over time. And this is a big change from the sort of ryegrass and ryegrass white clover mixes we're used to. In the first or second year, you might see early pioneer species like this quite strongly. But as the lay goes on into years three and four, you might find other species tend to take over or become more apparent, so yarrows and the bird's foot trefoil, for example. As you can see, these are quite big species, some of them. The look of the lay can be really different to our ryegrass and clovers as well. It can look quite uh, robust at times, and sometimes when we put the animals in, we almost lose them, but they always like it and it tastes pretty good. So as well as being really nutritious for livestock, these herbal lays can be really useful for the wider environment. We know it's doing good things to the soil, we're seeing great worm counts underneath it, we're improving soil organic matter, hopefully sequestering carbon as well, improving drainage with those deep roots, chicory for example, but we're also providing for pollinators. So here are just a few species that are still flowering at this time of the year, early November. We've got white clover, red clover, chicory with a really nice blue flower and then one of the later flowering species yarrow as well so you can start to see that between those three or four species plus the other ones that we've already lost throughout the season we get a really nice seasonal effect of early medium and late flowering species providing for pollinators bees and other beneficials as well So we're here at Farm Ed. As we said earlier on, we're in the middle of the Cotswolds between Oxford and Cheltenham, just outside Chipping Norton. This is about 107 acres altogether, so it's only a small farm that the company took on about six or seven years ago with the idea of creating an educational facility and resource for ourselves and for customers and the public as well. You can split the farm basically between 40 acres roughly of permanent pasture and about 60 acres of arable land. And within that, we've got lots of things going on, the centre of which is a diverse rotation over eight years of four years herbal lay and then four years cash crop. The idea, of course, being the herbal lay powers the cash crop, reducing the amount of inputs and reliance on artificial fertiliser, uh, pesticides and everything else. Within the diverse rotation, we've got some heritage wheat here. Um, this was drilled about two weeks ago and also under sown with a white clover mulch as well to try and feed that crop and again reduce our reliance on inputs as much as possible. And on the herbal lays themselves they're grazed from about April to November with sheep. Mob graze moved every day to try and concentrate as much of that muck and manure as we can to build up the soil reserves, build up organic matter and get the lays growing as much biomass as possible. 
just recently we've also introduced a very small micro dairy so we've now got some cattle or cows I should say grazing LA's and producing milk which is really exciting. Thank you for listening please join us on the 2nd of March at the live online discussion to ask me any questions directly on multi-species swords and herbal lays.